Hello, and welcome to the second attempt to record this. So, well, not just the second attempt to record this. I recorded it three times, I uploaded all three versions of those, and they all went up without sound. So, wish me luck. This is the com response to Washington Cheaties. Mm-hmm. And it's actually Sunday the 27th. Cheers. And as I'm doing this again... I'm doing this quickly. Again. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Ooh. Ugh. Technology. Technology is causing me fun. I do not know. Got to record also the Battle of Oliwa. After this, that's going to be... Well, it's going to go out the same day this is. And, by the way, the comment response video this week is probably going to go up on Wednesday from last week, just so we still have one. I still have one go up this week. But that will mean there will now be a video pretty much going up every day till a week after Christmas, uh, week after December is over. So, um, wish me luck and don't be, uh, and I probably will be complaining about lack of social life at some point, but it's my own fault. So just remind me of that. Thank you very much everyone for watching anyway. So, Let's get on to it. Let's get on to the Washington Cheaties and the comment response. Okay, so. The live. Ooh, the comments. Make sure they're in order. Newest first. All the ones I have. All the ones, including ones I haven't responded to. Da 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 da. Ooh, oh. Uh, Glimmer Glimmer, you need a suitable model of a tribal class for your train set. Parked at port with trains for comparison. Bonus points for a cruiser or model swordfish black... So model swordfish or black bird black one. All are interesting, and honestly... Okay. I'm gonna move the camera a bit. I do apologize for this. Bada -ba -ba. You might notice there's a little section sitting here, like... It's almost as if someone built a section of the table with plans for there being a little harbour there. <laughs> so yes, there is. And at that point I will probably need to change things around again because I will need to change to orientate so it'll be that side, but the camera and change all the things around again. But we'll leave that to one side. We'll leave that to one side. And I'm, I'm still used to it this side. <sighs> so we done. A Corgi is a second generation travel class, upsized for heavy cruiser duty. <laughs> I agree with Fight for Global First Amendment, so they think. Mm hmm. Aaron Cotras. I always thought Japan's cruisers were more famous at cheating the treaty than the Lexington class. Maybe that's the difference between Britain and America, though? Yes and no. Um, how do I put this politely? It, the thing is, the Americans would claim they didn't cheat. And especially at the time, they, they just used the full allowance. The fact that everyone could see through it meant others felt less compelled to cheat, or less compelled to buy the rules. It's one of those things. The Americans bend over backwards to look like they are obeying the technical and spirit of the law by doing, well, maybe not the spirit, but the technical the technicality of it. The trouble is, everyone's in there going, We know. You know, if I gave the example of the tribal class destroyers. Okay, let's open up the book. And go to my table. I think I seem to remember putting weights here. Yes, wait. So, normal displacement for these ships. For a 3D, 2,244 tonnes. For a Cossack, 2,030 tonnes. Gurkha, 1,999 tons. Maori, 2,006 tons. Mohawk, 2,017 tons. Eskimo, 1,987 tons. With bow. Mashona, 1,990 tons. Zulu, 2,050 tons. Somali, 2,014 tons. Tata, 2,025 tons. Sikh, 2,015 tons. Matable, 1,964 tons. Punjabi, 1,990 tons. Ashante, 2,020 tons. Bedouin, 2,035 tons. I know off the top of my head, Nubian, 2,050 tons. None of those are the same weights! 
None. They're all theoretically designed to be 1,850 tons. Not a single one in a standard displacement is 1,850 tons, and not a single one has the same normal displacement, not a single one has the same full displacement, because different yards build them differently, they have different stocks in them, they have different this, that, and other things added to them, and so there's going to be a variance. So if you turn round on your figures and say, I have reached 36,000 tons exactly, Everyone, and I mean everyone, is going to look at you and go, Come on. Pull the other one. And yes, Japan does cr cheat. Shamelessly. So does America. So does Japan, uh, Germany. So does Italy. So does France a little bit. Britain, of course, has the amazing disappear, uh, amazing appearing armor, which just slots in. Everyone cheats. That's the point of the treaties. We know everyone's going to cheat. It keeps the cheating within a, re a reasonable limitations. But the fact is, it's made more difficult to hold people to it when you do something quite so obvious. If America had turned around to everyone and gone, send out no saying, look, we're aiming for this. We used. We're using this because we can. However, they're not quite thirty-six thousand tons. They are thirty-six thousand one hundred and seven tons. What would the other powers do? Do? Did they think they'd go to war over it? No. The most Britain might go is. Okay. So, we're allowed to be a couple of hundred tons either way on our major ship designs, that's fine. Makes things a little easier on carrier design and this, that. It's fine. The, the thing is, the problem comes when you try and hide these things. The cover-up is worse than the actual deed. The deed is understandable. No one would hold it really against them at this point. The cover-up. That's what causes the trouble. There's an interesting then point from 96831, and I'm not going to get into some of the things. But the thing is, America could have taken all three Axis powers at the same time, as well as the British Empire could take all three Axis powers at the same time. It would just take a lot longer. And it would have been far more painful. I mean, Japan would have probably made it deep into the Indian Ocean, and maybe even got into in actually invaded into India. But let's be honest, the odds are the Indian Army would have managed to do some very nasty things to them. They did nasty things to them anyway. It would not have been nice. It would have been a total war, total mobilisation. You would have seen far more... The British would have had to mobilise far more African regiments. The Canadian, South African, Australian... Well, mainly the Canadian, let's be honest. Engineering plants would be do it, working massively over time. The war in Europe would probably have gone much the same as it did. But if you do take out... Because, you see, this is the thing. Let's say we take out Russia. And we take out America. Because that's what we have to do for Britain to... Uh, British Empire to end up fighting alone. They don't, there's no Russia in America. Well, that means there's no supplies from Russia going into Germany as well. And no supplies from America going into Britain and the British Empire. And, it sinks, and that has an impact on the war. It's the same as if you turn it around. And you say, okay, America on their own fighting. So you delete the British Empire. A, America now has a massive coastline where Canada was. Which might give them a stronger navy. But B, how useful is really the German navy and the Italian navy going to be at fighting America? 
And Japan certainly doesn't get as far as they could do. Admittedly, they can concentrate more efforts without having Australia as this attraction, or Singapore, or Hong Kong, or Wei Highway, or India, or all those parts of the world have gone because they're part of the British Empire have suddenly disappeared. There's also, honestly, a point to be made. World War Two becomes a global war because the enemies are fused. But I don't see America getting involved in a European war if Britain isn't fighting it. Because America doesn't have the connections. If Germany decided to invade Ireland... But in 19... Well, they're not part of the British Empire, are they? They're separate by that point. They are their own Republican independent. But yeah, maybe if Germany decided to invade Ireland. But there again, there might well be an American force already there. Because if... Well, Germany, etc. and all these things are mobilising. The uh, strong Irish element in American politics would probably have mobilised a lot quicker. And if you think some of the modern lobbies are powerful, they are nothing, absolutely nothing, compared to what the Irish lobby in the 1920s and 30s could do. So, yeah. That's basically what I see America getting involved in, but then again, it's defending Ireland from Germany. And if Germany doesn't have Britain to deal with, they just have France, but also... Italy doesn't have Britain to deal with, so why does Italy need Germany? And remember, Mussolini is egotistical enough, egotistical enough on his own, that that could lead to trouble. So, yeah, it's a really interesting scenario. If you take out the British Empire completely, does World War II happen as a world war? Does it end up being uh, a US-Japanese war? And perhaps a German-Italian war with France divided in between. That'd be something I would have to war game quite heavily. To work it out, really. Now, Anuk, regarding discussion about boilers, Yarrow, Fornicroft have UK pedigrees, but Babcock's Wilcox has 100% roots. From the company website, Babcock Wilcox traces uh, back to an 1856 patent issued to S. Wilcox and um, Stillman when George Babcock and C. Wilcox joined forces to design and market a boiler that increased heat services for better efficiency and was both effective and safe. In 1867, Babcock and Wilcox was formally established in Providence, Rhode Island, to manufacture and market water tube boilers. In 1891, Babcock Wilcox Limited is on corporate in Britain and effectively consolidates the company's international business with headquarters in London. Now, here is where I get involved. So, the point, to elaborate on the point I made further. Company may have 100% roots. Their, boiler and, their boilers and boiler designs don't, despite their own inventions being critical to them. They work with John Brown and Company, a lot of boiler design, especially in World War I era and into the 1920s. They especially enjoyed hiring Scottish engineers to work in their company, although, to be fair, in this period, everyone seems to be doing so. This is mainly done through the function that is Curtis as a company, but we'll leave that to one side. And, of course, information flowed both ways. One of the reasons why the USN was so sure about the information of its performance because was this very same uh, back channel, as a uh, uh, back channel, I'm sure. After all, John... Uh, John Brown built Hood. Now, I went and tracked down one of my books. The area of a wartime naval constructor, Sir Stanley Goodall, edited by Ian Buxton. Now, I both love and hate this book. I love it because it was an introdu it's an introduction and it's something I can give to students. I hate it because it starts in 1939 and so much of his interesting stuff happens before 1939. He wrote this on Henderson. Sir R. H. Henderson died at 10.40 on the 2nd of May. Better than living on helpless, but tragic he should go before his labour's fruit has fully appeared. Now, in here is mentioned a gentleman. Uh, let's 
This one. He is Sir Stephen J. Piggott. You might want to look him up. He was lived 1880 to 1955. He was Sir Stephen J. Piggott. Okay, keep wondering, why am I talking about this guy? A talented American engineer who came to John Brown in 1908 to help them build their Curtis steam turbine, marketed as the Brown Curtis. He rose to the position of chief engineering designer in 1920. Following the retirement of Sir Thomas Bell, he became managing director at Clyde Bank in 1935, responsible for the completion of both Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth. Goodall regarded Clyde Bank in as his um, go-to shipyard during the Second World War, where Piggott could be relied upon to assist in every way, from loading draftsmen to the Admiralty, finish <laughs> incomplete hulls from other shipbuilders, to becoming lead shipyard for the big aircraft carrier Malta, although she was cancelled after the war. How do I make this point? My family has a history of doing many professions. We often serve in the Navy. But mostly my family's traditions come down to naval architecture, civil engineering, and banking. Now, I'm sorry about the bankers. Every family has a few in the UK. They just turn up. It's just... I'm not sure where they come from, but they do. Just these people who have... Some sort of love for maths. But anyway, leaving that to one side, the naval architects have been many, including a couple on my dad's side, who spent most of the 1900s, and when I say this, I mean pretty much all the 1900s, working on ships, including two who, for different companies... One British, one American. They were both British. Would work for a month in a shipyard in the UK. Then get the fastest boat across the Atlantic. Spend about another next four weeks at a shipyard in America. To, uh, and then do come back. And then do it again. And come back. And do it again. And come back. And they kept going across the Atlantic. Why? Because in those days, that was the method you ensured commonality and worked on your designs across the world. And you integrated research across the world. <sighs> they racked up sea miles like you wouldn't believe. And because I know that, because I know that family history... That is why I know the levels of integration that were going on between American and British shipbuilding and British, American and British ship design and the information flowing across. And that is why I can confidently say, yeah, the British chose not to build, uh, not to wait for the higher pressure boilers to come available because they decided they need to build ships sooner and standardize to make things easier training wise. But if World War II had waited off, you'd have probably seen them move and change to a higher pressure boiler system and start changing all their ships over. Some of the, battle the battleships would probably be left, but some of the cruisers would have been upgraded. Some of the destroyers, definitely would larger destroyers, would have been upgraded. And that's what we're talking about. Because there is so much information going backwards and forwards between the two. I'm going to say, the chief engineer in the yard, which is building HMS Hood, the vessel which scares, scares the Americans so much, is an American. And the British trust him. He didn't... I'm not saying, by the way, that he leaked information or was a spy. No way, shape, or form were any of them spies. But there is still a level of information flow, a level of confirmation that goes through in perfectly acceptable conversation. And that is what would have happened. J. Uh, J. the Happy Wyvern. Um, so, a question I have from discussion. 
of Lexington Battlecruiser and Ranger carriers. Would the Lexingtons have been sunk at Pearl Harbor, or would they have been a heavy escort for the carriers out making deliveries on the 7th? It would probably have been battlecruiser carrier combos, in which case they'd have probably been part of the task forces out. Because that would have made sense, and that would have also had a big impact on the war going forward. Because if you think about it, if every aircraft carrier has with it a battlecruiser which is providing heavy air defence plus defence against... Um, so larger surface combatants, at least the withdrawal coverage, it's going to change how you carry out those things and how you carry out the operations they come off. Pretty really interesting. Also from the Jade Happy Wyvern, yeah, I bet if Spain and Greece somehow had war during this time, Jordos Avarov would manage to embarrass the Espanyols. Um, theoretically, the Espanyols should be better, but as we know from the, uh, Spanish-American War of 1899, the Spanish Navy doesn't always get the training it needs. So, in that case, the George Savaroff might well deliver a very unhappy upset. Jehirendorf. I've always been amused by the styles of cheating. In all shipbuilding, there is a little bit of a fudge factor in design and construction of ships. For example, ships of the same class build in different yards. One yard ship will be always be 20 or 30 tons heavier than another yard. In the case of the US, they seem to be use all their fudge factor up on just two ships, Lexington and Saratoga. Japan tried to put 10 pounds in a 5 pounds bag, which made them very powerful and very fragile. As for the RN, after the treaty system fell apart, they just happened to find in their navy yards armor that just happened to perfectly fit the counties. Amazing. It is a luck. It is luck. The Duke. You should come here to Hamilton, Ontario. I saw a case of iron brew in grocery store yesterday. Oof. Visiting Hamilton, Ontario. I love the people. It's a very friendly pay place. I had a lot of fun. I enjoy Canada. Dear guy, 001. The Germans did develop a 16-inch gun. Yes, for the unbuilt... Well, the, they had two under construction. At start of constructing and four more planned. H-39 class. But they end up being used on the Atlantic Wall. Yeah. <sighs> but it's it's more fun. They design it, but it's it's even more issues going on. McHorus, but that's a lot. I was late because I was so engrossed in your YouTube discussion. I actually have heard that from a student recently. My sister's had even worse. She had them watching my videos in the back of her class, which she complained about to me. Apparently it was my fault. I was going, I wasn't there. I was in a completely different county. Nicole Ross, wouldn't a better method for treaties count rifle barrels rather than ship tonnage? Hmm. Limitation on ships being their t barrel ton uh, barrels rather than tonnage. Hmm. Is it terrible that I could see someone packing all their ships with twin turret uh, with very wide, fat twin turrets that, and I could see Britain especially doing this twin turrets that are very very fat that. Then when they uh, when they think war's gonna come, they just can slot out. Oh, we've taken off the middle bit. Oh, we've got space for a third gun in the center. Isn't it amazing? Suddenly have battleships go from having I don't know three hundred rounds per gun and eight guns to having two hundred rounds per gun. And 12 guns. <laughs> oh, I can see that. <sighs> it would be an interesting methodology. But there again, the size of the ships involved would be colossal. If you're not including, you're not factoring in tonnage. So, let's go to the long patrol for this. The cheaties, 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 cheaties. Washington Treaties, Long Patrol, 48 comments. Goodness gracious me, that's a lot. Let's see what they are. Okay, this is going to be a long one. Oh, good lord. Hey, caramba. Mark Harkness, man, Riggs, you've had a long discussion here going. Uh, had a night 61 and night 631 and Quizmaster, thank you for your kind comments. Right then, then Booba. Lexington 8 inch guns aren't an absurd inclusion in the 1920s. By 1940, sure, but as various name problems in the US and did short time, there is lack of range and lack of radius constantly had the carriers stumbling the service governors, at which point the firepower of another heavy cruiser is welcome. Uh, 
Okay, so there is a very long discussion. And it's quite interesting. But there are some points in here to put. Uh, Nova Topaz. You can't look at the Lexington's and Saratoga's guns and say those would be better than a cruiser. Remember, the treaty exists and it puts a limit on how many cruisers you can build by, uh, have by limiting the tonnage they dis uh, amount of tonnage they displace. Well, they don't. Um, okay, London Treaty limits the cumulative amount of tonnage you can have for cruisers, right? Washington Treaty only limits the total tonnage of the cruiser. So the cruiser, you're allowed a 10,000 ton cruiser, but you can have as many of them as you want under the Washington Treaty. So the Washington Treaty has no caps on the total tonnage of shit cruisers are able to be built. That's the London Treaty. So... Here is the point, and this is something which several of you are sort of skirting around here. The idea of a cruiser instead of the, uh, the set of the 8-inch guns on the Lexingtons. Under the, under the London treaties, it actually makes sense. And I can see where you're going, well, it's better to have the guns because if you get caught unawares by a cruiser, you can fight them off and hopefully get away and all these things. Well... Let's be honest, the odds are you won't, but I can see you why you want them. I personally think they're a lot more complicated. But actually, under the Washington Treaty, under the Washington Treaty, you could save that tonnage, use it for something else, and build another cruiser. As long as that cruiser didn't displace more than 10,000 tons. That's it. That's the thing. Under the Washington Treaty, and this is about the Washington Treaties. If we talk about London Treaties, then you have more of a case. But, yeah, the Washington Treaty um, is not... It doesn't limit their total tonnage. And... Riggs, all due respect to Dr. Clark, I think he is wrong. It's not intended to get the carriers close to enemy ships. At when point did I say they were going to get close to enemy ships? I said at no point should they be in a scenario where they actually start fighting back and think they should be fighting back. That's not a good scenario for them, and I don't think the guns are sensible. The limited range of scouting aircraft and lack of radar gave ample opportunity for enemy forces to encounter each other without warning, as proven by the war games. Yes and no. As shown by the war games, if you have an artificially restricted area, artificially restricted area, you can bump into each other, and they did notice. And The examined flight deck was a good idea. The armored hangar was not. I'm not sure how you got to that one either. It's you. You've come up. You're making the case that they should have the eight-inch guns. They are a large target and hard to manoeuvre, in terms of that scenario. But they're also supposed to be fast, and they're supposed to be operating the escort with cruisers. Now, yes, there is a scenario where you could have them off operating on their own, and therefore they could be caught un unawares by an enemy cruiser or enemy cruiser force, and you're in trouble. But, again, I refer you back to it, and this was something which all exercises agreed, and which is one of the reasons I have the big problem of what happens to Glorious and Courageous in World War Two is the British own exercises and doctrine said that those things shouldn't happen. You should never have a carrier going off on their own. Again, armoured deck versus armoured hangar, that's it's the same thing, and the armour, the sides on the armoured all you're basically saying when you don't like an armoured hangar versus an armoured deck is you want the armour just on the flight deck and no nothing below 
on the sides when you get hit from the sides. Which turned out to be very useful when various kamikaze etc. decided to punch into them. So, yeah. Basically, the point I was making about the Lexingtons is, under the Washington Treaty, you can build more cruisers. Build more cruisers. Use tonnage of 8-inch guns and space and all the other things allocated in this city for them, crew, etc., all these things, to be a better aircraft carrier. That is a far more sensible use of the ton uh, tonnage and displacement than that. And the point is, quite a few nations did know that when they were working on those things. This is the thing, as much as I love Lexington Saratoga, and you can make the case they are very early aircraft carriers, so you can point out the things, there are a fair number of other carriers wandering around at this point. So again, if, if you're talking fitting casemated six-inch guns or so, something lower down the ship, I can understand that. It's the 8-inch twin turrets that high up in the ship. Because it's not just the weight of the guns, etc. themselves and that you put up there. They're so high up in the ship, you have to stick extra weight and extra ballast down in the ship to provide the stability for that level of top weight. It's just a never-ending amount of design compromises you have to make because of your decision to have those guns up there when you can, under the Washington Treaty... Build another to build another cruiser. That's basically the point on the Lexingtons, and that's why. So, and honestly, honestly, they know they're doing it. They know it's a problematic decision. Thank you, Jeffrey Endorf. Speaking of the treaty era, how about a video about Hector Bywater and H.G. Wells? Wells was a correspondent that covered the Washington Treaty, and he felt the treaty brought in a new era of uh, amity amongst nations. I'm writing about the role of the National Council, the direction of armaments, which led popular engagement around the treaty. The, to uh, the toll of public opinion on the operation negotiations, I feel, is unprecedented. Mark Harkness then responds to that. Bywater also wrote about the Great Pacific War, but while he imagined that it would start with airstrikes, he envisioned, for example, Kaga turned back into a battleship and that would be a decisive clash of fleets near Yap Island, the big, uh, big gun line slugging it out. Um, honestly, I think a lot of journalists and a lot of public opinion were swept along with stuff that wasn't really there. There is a lot of stuff which is a good cover. But... I don't really think it's as public opinion led as it's as it's made out to be. Mainly because, as a rule, in my experience, politicians, if public opinion will provide them with a cover, they will happily pander to it and pretend to go along with it. But if it's not something they support, they will then try and look strong by standing up to public opinion because you know they have more information and more reasoning, and they're always usually the same. My heartness, diplomacy, the art of telling some to go, well, in such a way to look forward to, uh, to the trip. Phil Vanland, military diplomacy, serve all due respect, go foxtrot yourself. Hmm. HS Verdun, I think the cheaty ships are interesting because they show where people are valuing things. If the Americans didn't think having 36,000 tons of the cheat wasn't useful, they wouldn't have built them in the 20s and then made captaincy in a prestigious posting. As you say, the admirals do know the change is coming. Aircraft have doubled performance in four years, and are going to cheat as much as they can to get around it. Or rather, they know that aircraft are going to be useful. That's the thing. They're looking at aircraft to fill in for numbers of ships and provide reconnaissance and long-range strike and all sorts of things which are going to be useful. Same British experimental conversions to get as much tonnage as possible. I suspect the Admiralty knows potentially enemy ships are going to be uh, going to be overweight cruiser-wise and builds up armour for the plausible deniability reasons on the counties. Oh, the armour? No, it's just something we have lying around the yard. Totally useless whistles. 
fact, they're also about the length of the big 15-inch uh, of the big 15-inch gunships and look similar to them. And I'm sure is also just a pure coincidence for a navy building up a night fighting doctrine based on sneaking up on the enemy and knifing them when they aren't looking. Yeah. Matthew Ridger, cool pre droughts steel-clad battleships instead, perhaps? I'm going to pick stick with Sovereign battleships, mainly because it seems to be winding some people up. And you know me. That's why I, Mainly it's winding up other academics. Please note, uh, it's not a case of me and... Uh, I would point this out. Winding up people on YouTube as sort of in the comments is never really that something which mo is going to motivate me. I don't do any videos to wind up them. If it winds up some of my academic colleagues and leads to some fun debates that really help make a day at work pass more quickly, yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I admit this. I am that bigger child occasionally. I admit this. I see, yeah, but on the big gun cavalry ships, the Americans, frankly, were the ones who got um, into problems, as they have the free 23 knot Colorados, but really, Japanese two Nagatos aren't much of a threat as really the four Congos. One Tiago and two Renown are a threat. But yeah, who has the only 40,000 ton plus ship at the same time? Uh, yeah, the British. Age is well done. I do remember Ryan the Battleship New Jersey arguing the Americans were ahead on building the new ships, time frame wise, although Drac talking about the conversion, the conversation is my only real source in this. And I think the British could have accelerated building proto speeds to get ships on the out of the slips far as fast. Colorado's are designed as 21 knotters, aren't they? So perhaps not that useful. I do think the hypothetical renowned type 30 knots with a bit of armour. I'm English, so use that spelling, sorry. When reality sets in, is an, our interesting ships as a theory exercise and a useful Congo killer at the time. I think Hood is a good ship and name gets brought down because of the two plus natural 20s. On the uh, on the dice from the Dis Bismarck shot, or is it just, or it just eats Prince Jürgen for breakfast like Balakris is designed to, and Bismarck runs away in ninety percent of the situations. But I think she's a bit of a white elephant. Hood is a Queen Elizabeth plus, and so can run around killing some trade ships and U.S. battleship one on one. But in a big Jutland engagement, engagement, everything is happening won't tip the balance. Therefore, I think the treaties all depend upon perspective. In the long run, I think they are a hindrance to the world, given the effect on the Allies in World War Two. And I'll lower than everyone wants because Congress and Parliament will always go as cheap as they can and I won't go into how much they keep blundering on that uh, that one, even as someone who cautiously dislikes state taxation and spend rates. But I understand why the powers don't like the idea. However, a of war, even if they don't understand the reasons of the chances are of it, are probably like we do now. Hmm. point I always make when we talk about government spending is it's... The government you need to fight World War II is going to be a lot larger and a lot more complex than you need to run an island population of 100 people. You need the right size government, and you need to decide what you want the government to do. Personally, I prefer having taxation the state supports some things infrastructure like roads etc it's quite nice to have it all standardized everywhere and not having rich areas poor and poor areas where the infrastructure generally is suffers more but has it's all sort of standardized because it tends to help the economy and helps everyone else get to, everyone get to work and school and all these things so okay I want the government to do that and there are a few other things which are quite sensible for the government to be doing. Defence. Mm-hmm. And if you're going to do defence, you need a foreign policy and foreign service. Okay. And if you're going to tax or do taxation, you need some form of checking on that taxation. So you do need some form of parliamentary organisation as well as government to check off the spending. And... Uh, uh, and to check on the appointment of the ambassadors, and to check on the appointment of the generals and admirals, and all these things. And um, education is good, because if you leave it all up to charities and private companies, you can get some very interesting things going on. Very interesting things going on. The original reason the British government gets involved in education is because there are some... Very interesting things being taught in schools. And it's a case of no, uh, no, and no. So, yeah. 
and it starts off with various at various levels until we get the system we have today. I'm not always that keen on the system we have today. Uh, there is some serious problems in some of the things which are being added onto it as an ad hoc system in the UK. And all sorts of issues like that. But it could be a lot worse. It could be a lot worse. So there's room for improvement, yes. But it's not that bad. And yes, I'm speaking this as a scholarship boy who went to a private school. And I still use the phrase that you used at school to describe me. And I went because when I went going to school, the provision for dyslexics and other thing, people with educational need differences, like myself, in the state system was terrible. It's got a lot better. I know it's got better because one of my best friends works in the school helping blind children, etc., study and learn in mainstream schooling. And that's great. And that's how it should be. But it takes a time to get that. So, education, infrastructure, defence, foreign policy, all good areas. Need to be doing that taxation, so you need someone for the doing the taxes, and you need someone to check it all. So you have Parliament. Health system? Well, for all its distractors on the NHS, I rather like having a universal healthcare system. I think it's rather sensible to have one. Because, here is the dirty little secret, healthier populations are happier populations. Happier populations tend to be more productive populations. More productive populations tend to yield greater, uh, greater economic benefits which boost everyone. Okay? If people, when they're feeling ill, aren't scared to go to the doctor because they can't afford the bill... They tend to be a happier person and get fixed earlier than when it, than later, which actually means it's less of a problem for ind for business, for industry, for everyone, for the economy as well. It actually makes it cheaper to deal with medical problems if people go when it is a small a small niggle, rather than waiting till they can't they can't not go. Saying that is the NHS system perfect. Nope. Is there any universal medical care, medical care system in the world which is perfect? Nope. Is there any medical care system in the world which is perfect? Nope. Because they're all designed by humans. So they all reflect the biases of the people who design them, the people who've modified them as they've come along, the people who've adapted them, meddled with them as they've come along, and no human is perfect, so no system designed by a human is going to be perfect. That doesn't mean we stop working with it and stop trying to improve it. But we have to accept that when we try and improve it, it's probably going to be impacted by our own biases. And so ends the political sermon. But basically, I'm, I spent far too long yesterday having to deal with people who were going... There was people who wanted... There was, I was sitting in a debate with people who, one side, wanted government to do everything... And the other side were government do nothing, small, ultra small government. And I was sitting there going, you do realise you're both absolutely insane. And I do know I have to watch my language. I try and be careful. Sometimes I do admit there are phrases which, when I'm trying to come up with short term, other phrases to use short term, short termism and discuss that, I tend to some for some reason dip into phrases like short sighted and all these things which are not meant against those against people who are it's no really not it's just me trying to use a thing and going through my brain and thinking of other phrases to describe people who are doing short term is thinking and yeah it's not meant as sort of the people uh, as in people who actually are it's meant against these people actually it's gonna sound strange because actually people who actually do have those things uh, who actually are short-sighted tend to be very good at thinking a couple of steps ahead because they have to be 
So actual short-sighted people would probably not be short-sighted in government. If that makes sense. Leaving that to one side. But basically, no, I was sitting in the sitting going, you do realise if you, your arguments are absolutely, completely, whilst they have their own internal logic that you believe that you believe in, once you put them in the real world, both break down completely. You do not want the government to do everything because that means you will have absolutely no freedom and choice at all, because governments cannot work like that. They cannot give. They cannot be Mercedes Benz, which tries to give everyone infinite options on everything, because they can build it. They're trying to design a system where they're going to be tailoring a car for every single individual on the planet to exactly suit that person's needs for some reason, and you can't have no government at all. For starters, once you get through all the taxation and all the other stuff, you need a justice system. Because you're probably going to want laws, because you don't want people taking the laws into their own hands. So which means you need a police, you need prisons, you need judges, you need lawyers on both sides, because you need a defence, because otherwise, and here's the reason you need a defence, so to stop the there being things where mistakes are made in the private prosecution and the, the, the police, and to make sure they come to light, so the right person actually goes to jail for it. So, what do you cut? And, by the way, you need administrators for all of that as well. You really do. Now, I have some problems with some of the level of administration and blo uh, administrative bloat. It does seem a bit obscene. And this is off the topic of conversation, but other question. But it's a case of, you need administrators. You do. Because who's going to check that all those people who are doing those roles get paid? Get the things they need. Because the last thing you want is to train up an army. And then not have people organising and making sure it's getting paid and equipped properly. Because armies, when they're not paid and equipped properly, tend to get very problematic for governments and populations to deal with. They tend to get testy. So, yeah. Right, politics over. Um... Nice well, Doc, considering that according to U.S. congressional debate records, there were ideas and emeralds were to be superversion of the hood. If they'd gone with the 15-inch 50s, which I've discussed in Nelson class recently, um, they would have been interesting. If you'd gone with the F3 design as your basis, and you'd worked on and modified that, and I think they could have done that with the 15-inch 50s, I, whilst they wouldn't have been super hoods, and you would have needed to do some things. I think they would have certainly been scary. But they wouldn't, of course, have had the 16-inch guns. So they could have inured themselves by going, well, they don't have 16-inch guns. That's what I did there. Phil Vanlon, air power, naval power. Yeah, the US was annoyed, not the British, but annoyed, at Mitchell. Not because he showed them up and sank a battleship. They were... US, they were... Annoyed because he turned a valuable exercise into a useless, expensive ego stroking joyride. Yeah. The point was to learn well, what heavy bombers can uh, bombs can do to warships. He sank Ostrofiland with a second attack before Navy could inspect the damage from the first attack. All the Navy learned was that the Army aviators were made up of arrogant, insubordinate aeoles, which most of the Navy brass had already suspected. Definitely. It, it's one of those things. It, it sounds really good until you realise, well, hang on, this meant they couldn't do the whole purpose of the test. Um, the Wankers of Franconium. The Washington treaties, a treaty treaties are like Formula 1 teams. They just interpret the rules some, uh, somewhat differently. Not looking for what can't be do, but what is not mentioned. Uh, Flifkoff. Slight disagreement. It's not possibly the first naval arms limitation treaty. Maybe you meant that instead of arms limitation treaties generally. And aircraft carriers were second in treaty because of decreasing displacement, and not because of perceived importance. But I'm just guessing there. Love the channel, well done. But I'm just guessing there. Okay. That's always a fun phrase to use. But... We actually have the transcripts and various other things from the um, treaty discussions, etc. We know where the carriers rank and why they put them in. 
they don't put any tonnage limitation, cumulative tonnage limitations on any other class other than carriers and battleship, well, capital ships as they call them. Uh, they don't do a number of level specifications as they do on carriers and capital ships on any other class. They limit them mainly to that you can't build escorts or any vessels below which aren't carriers or capital ships to be over 10,000 tons and have more than 8 inch guns. I'm not guessing when I say they were second in importance. And it's because of their perceived importance overall. I know it from the treaty records and from the archives and from the actual discussions. So, yeah. Now, naval arms are still arms. This was my response. These were the first arms control treaties and have provided a starting point and touchstone for every treaty since agreed. Whether strategic arms limitations talks or all level things agreed since the 1920s, they have been the basis sought out. Now, I'm sure you can point to the work of the Amphiotic... Amphi... Amphiotic... Leagues? Amphiotic Leagues? Uh, but that was more of a Greek in the city thing. That they forget or remember as and when convenient, the Rush-Bago Treaty, and even the First Hage Conference. But the thing is, those treaties either apply to a specific geographic area or are a limitation what you do in war and, to an extent, acceptable weaponry. The Naval Treaties are the Arms Limitations Treaty model as will be understood today. Those efforts, previous efforts, are the germination of the idea that is brought in to an extent by the Treaty of Versailles but comes into existence, is born to the world through the Washington Naval Treaty. And, yeah. It, it's one of those things that I can understand where you're coming from, because people can go, well, there's this treaty and that treaty, all that and that. We can talk about all them. But when you go through them and you go, well, what's the modern definition and what's the definition we use of an arms limitation treaty? You go back, first one is the Washington Naval Treaty that actually fits it. Uh, the rest are all portions, getting ideas of it. It's an interesting process, but they're not quite that. Yes, the Clark family is into the competitive betting and yeah, with each other, and yes, 10,000 subscribers. And seeing as I've already talked about politics in this video, YouTube video, I doubt that's going, this is going to help me that much. But, you know, honestly, I don't think what I talked about was actually political, but I know people will think it's political, but it's basically me just saying you need right-sized government. It's somewhere in the middle between the extremes and... You have to work it out how it fits your nation and what you want to do it to do. And when people give you glib answers, which are very quick, like the government can do this or do all this, or we need no government, we need to cut the government. I worry. Nothing in history has ever been solved by glib answers. And I know I give glib answers occasionally when people are asking me questions and I'm just quickly going through it offhand and I just go, yeah, no. But the thing is, you need context, nuance, and you need content. You need an answer which is not just five words or less. Christina Rodriguez. Dr. Clark, a good wine ages slowly. From what I've seen with history channels and subscriptions, it takes a few years. It does. The History Guide, The Armchair Historian, Dragon Power, Extra Credits History, The Great War Channel, History Hustle, Act, all took several years to grow. History Hustle is one of the channels I follow close to the beginning. We started to get, uh, take off after a few years. Like a good business, it takes three years to spread the name and five years to make, a span, uh, to make it expand. I know. It's literally the only time I ever get worried is when it's approaching 25th of December and it's the family bet the family year long bet scenario. Ay, caramba. Mm. Thank you, and I agree. It's the family bets. And the friendly Christmas bets reminds me of a lot of Christmas movie. 1983, Trading Place with Dan Aykroyd, Eddie Murphy, and Jimmy Lee Curtis. We watch that on Christmas Day quite often. Yeah. To get along. Um. Bumper E23. I, doctor, I've recently purchased a book called Warships of Washington. The Development of Five Major Fleets, 1922-1930 by John Jordan. Have you heard of it? And if so, what do you think of it? Well, I have heard of it. And, um, let's see. I have that one. And I have that one. These are the two books. They are about as good a starting point on the treaties as you can get. I don't agree with anything in them, but I'm another historian. John Jordan does absolutely exceptional work. I always enjoy his books. These are really worthwhile. His, uh, his other books on the French Navy. I do have them somewhere around me. 
<laughs> Somewhere, he says, I've got to sort out my book pile again. My book, I've added more books. Thank you, Spencer Jones. Thank you, Director Kid. Geo Guy, did I hear Guy hold forks, fireworks, and macarons? Probably. Geo Guy, so when the German, uh, uh, Germany did the Anglo German Naval Agreements, they could have had five capital ships Scharnhorst, Neisenau, Bismarck, Tirpitz, and an H class? Or was this a tonnage thing and the war intervened? Well, as Nick Vorden puts, Germany never intended to stick to the treaty anyway, so Germany would try for their plan if World War II doesn't start, which would be ten battleships and three O-class battlecruisers. Please note, Sean Olsen, nice now, are considered under their battleship numbers. They're planning on building six H-class. Thank you, Stafford. Thank you, Paul. Centuries. I wonder what Nelsons would look like had the RN built them at 35,000 tons and then gone and used the same loopholes ESN did in Lexington as so that they were actually 38,000 tons. Thirty-eight thousand tons would add on roughly four thousand two hundred tons in standard to them. Now four thousand two hundred tons extra in standard. That's probably going to get them up to twenty-eight knots, if not higher. They probably, I would think, would go with the F three arrangement because it's better for the secondaries. Please note. There is a reason for the F3 being... I'm going with the F3. It's better for the secondaries because you can move the secondaries more forward. This is one of the things with Howick. It allows you to... The arrangement you go with Nelson Rodney allows you to truncate the barbette and the armoured spec space as much as possible. It allows max efficiency from that perspective. The F3 arrangement is less efficient. Um, where's the book? Behind me... But I don't know. And if you want to see the F3, there are designs in here. The design. Actually, this is where I got the drawings from. John Jordan's books are excellent. Oh, there's the G3 battlecruiser section. G3 battlecruiser design. They do look cute. Scout cruisers. Where is it in here? It's in here somewhere, he says. He knows it's in here somewhere. That's Nelson Ronnie. There you go. There's G3. Uh, there's the F2 F3 arrangement, and basically that allows a better line-out arrangement of your secondary guns by raising C turret, but it makes it longer overall. Now, which means it uses more displacement. So if you've got 58,000 tons, you're probably going for that. You're probably going for 28 knots, and you might, you probably keep, possibly keep the full G3 turret arrangement. Goodness knows how tough those six and those turrets would be. I think the really interesting thing is going with a 16-inch gun as the upper limit. Because the British, if they couldn't get... Would really have probably preferred it to be the 16.5-inch gun, which they had one already. And would have been interesting, because if they had gone with the 16.5-inch gun they already had already, that would have been a very interesting ship which would come out. But, um, yeah, 16-inch guns... Probably the F arrangement with the other turrets more spread out along the ship and probably four twin six inch guns each side and probably about the same number of twin of oh, twin four inch gun four point seven inch by AA guns. Richard Cuts. First I'd rather have ginger snaps, really, than chocolate. Secondly, I've always thought the Armistad should have said that I may never meet line at the end uh, at the end of the be at the beginning of Pickett's charge in Gettysburg. As for cheating, it depends on whether you are violating the exact words or spirit rule. Of course, you can do both, but not always. Yeah, that's fun. Thank you, Nick Vaughan. Thank you, S. A. Brock. Amnon Cox. So, uh, thank you. 
What if I was designing what if scenario? I decided to switch to buying warship tanks or buy their horsepower. Turns out it works. By this measure, 100,000 shaft horsepower hull would get net you a slow battleship, while 120,000 shaft horsepower hull would net you a very fast cruiser. I worked with real ship types in this port, uh, ship types in, in portion. For Germany, as an odd example, one can purchase 300 pounds of four tanks for the shaft horsepower of a single Hipper class. Considering, consider purchasing instead 24 Weinemann class armed lighthouses, 5,000 shaft horsepower each, for the shaft horsepower cost of that cruiser. An armed lighthouse? Okay, alright. That's just. That's an interesting idea. But no, it's. It's an interesting world we live in. It is. And I was looking for and really enjoyed that discussion that was going on about Lexington's. Okay. There are people who disagree with me. And I can understand where they disagree with me. And it's one of those things. If if you were talking under the London Washington a London Treaty scenario, I would uh, if the London Treaty had been the wording of the Washington Treaty, i.e., the limitations on the number of cruisers overall, I would wholeheartedly support the Lexington class having those 18 inch guns, because of all the arguments you make about them needing the defence and all the things coming out of being able to get close and the difficulty of the aircraft. But under the Washington Treaty, I don't. Under the Washington Treaty, that's a lot of weight high up in the ship that needs to be ballasted with even more weight down in the ship, and it's inefficient, and it's inelegant, and it basically just causes you problems. And you can build that extra cruiser. So that is my point. In fact, you could build an extra couple of cruisers if you're willing to, willing to spend the money. And what probably happens then? I have a feeling the tonnage, a total tonnage of cruisers probably goes up. Because if America has built more cruisers and wants to build more heavy cruisers because they worry about the Pacific, then the total number of cruisers limitation will probably be different than it was. You probably get a cruiser limitation tonnage of 240,000 tons or something like that. Which the British might like, because if you get 240,000 tons for heavy cruisers and 240,000 tons for light cruisers, light cruisers theoretically can be 6,000 tons each, which you could get 40 of. And heavy cruisers, that would allow you to get 24. So you would have 64 cruisers, which is not far off the British 70 cruiser requirement. Especially when you factor in the British would also be allowed to keep in overage ships, which they were very careful, which is why they were holding on to the C's and D's. Yeah. I could see that working very well. But that's not what happened. I think I also did mention in one of the videos, actually, that it was under the Washington Treaty. It might be one of the many recordings of this. Seriously, I've recorded this video now about four or five times. There were three times attempted to recording it before uh, to, to get and those versions just didn't upload for some reason and didn't work on YouTube. And now I'm doing, this is the, this is the fourth time, I think. Or is it the fifth time when I'm editing together? I'm not sure. It's, it's, it's been interesting. Anyway, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed, and thank you for all your support. I would normally add in a question here, but there are going to be so many videos coming up this week, and going from now on, I am actually saving some of the questions. So, all I would like to see down below is, if you wouldn't mind, any ideas, any topics you would like to see covered in the year of technology. There is already a list of them going around on Patreon of the topics that have already been put included, but I have got some spaces, and I am letting patrons are suggesting them, but I also would like people who are viewers to suggest them, and thank you. And thank you again for your support. As mentioned at several points during this video, there is a 10,000 subscriber bet going on between my aunt and my mum and her twin sister, my aunt. If I get to 10,000 subscribers by midnight on the 24th of December, 
my mum gets some fancy bath soaps and if I don't then my aunt gets given by my mum some chocolate there's some various baked goods I think and uh, basically I don't know it's chocolates and bath stuff going to my mum and it's baked goods and things going to my aunt yeah uh, it's fun uh, life is interesting it's normal and it's nothing. There is, please note, there is nothing bad about it. Someone's saying, "Oh, it's terrible." You're not. No, this is what my family does. Okay, we do things like this, and we have year-long bets that come on Christmas and all that come on Christmas and that sort of thing. And whoever wins gets to set the bet again. So this is why I want my mom to win, so I don't have because she's promised me I won't have to have the oldest bet ever again. <sighs> Thank you. I oh, know. Take care.